Hello, and happy Saturday uh, to you. So I'm Dr. Young Tran, and I was at the John Wayne Airport in Orange County yesterday, getting ready to hop onto American Airlines to head over to you. And uh, as I was sitting there, I got this text from American Airlines that the flight is delayed <laughs> by uh, close to two hours. And then I got a second text saying that because the flight is delayed, uh, my connection flight at Dallas-Fort Worth is not going to make it to Branson. And guys, um, yeah, here I am <laughs> on video. I was very much looking forward to meet you in person and, um, <laughs> and to uh, check out Branson and uh, to hang out with the Bien Hoa Air Base uh, reunion guys and girls. And, uh, but uh, this is second best, right? I, uh, I deeply apologize, but I'm glad at least I get to, to get to see you and, uh, and go on video here and, and chat with you. Um, by the way, I normally do not look like this at all. Uh, I'm not a bow tie guy or, uh, or a suit guy, but for this event, I wanted to, uh, this event is special and, uh, and I'll tell you why. So I'm in Orange County primary care physician, uh, more than primary care, I do a whole bunch of other stuff. I, um, I'm the chief medical officer for Irvine Clinical Research. I uh, have worked uh, this past year uh, doing a lot of COVID work. Um, we are with an organization called 360 Clinic, which is the largest uh, COVID uh, test operator, COVID testing operator in Orange County. We've uh, done over 400,000 uh, COVID tests for the community in um, partnership with Orange County Public Health. And I also live in a, an area called Little Saigon. Little Saigon. I don't know if any of you guys have ever heard of Little Saigon before, but essentially we're in an area that has the largest number of Vietnamese outside of Vietnam. So there's uh, far above uh, 100,000 Vietnamese that live here. And so uh, I and my family are here uh, with, uh, with the rest of the community. I wanted to share with you a little bit about what I do uh, currently. And I uh, also wanna share with you a little bit about my story. I'm a medical missionary with an organization called uh, called tongue out kind of like sticking your tongue out like this right I can only do this on video right probably not in person <laughs> uh, tongueout.org is the organization I'm with I'm a, a medical missionary I take um, doctors nurses uh, lots of high schoolers and college students to um, uh, all over the world, actually, prior to uh, COVID uh, stopping us from our travels. Uh, every year we are in Vietnam. Uh, every year we are in Haiti, Peru, Oaxaca, Mexico. And, uh, and when uh, disaster strikes here in the US, uh, we're here as well. Uh, our, I took a team uh, of medical docs and nurses to uh, Houston, Texas during Hurricane Harvey a few years back. And uh, we had a team during Hurricane Katrina. Um, and uh, so medical missions, my passion, uh, we're around the world just providing uh, free health care to, uh, to those who are the least of these in, um, in society. And uh, as a matter of fact, I was thinking, is there any silver lining going on video talking to you guys because I'd rather be with you in person right and uh, to interact in person uh, one of the silver lining perhaps is since we're on video I can actually show you some videos of uh, some of the work I do and um, and share with you uh, what we do I'm uh, I'm married uh, my wife is Jenny uh, I have a son and a daughter Jonathan and Elizabeth 
And uh, I'm also a Jarhead uh, Corporal Trend, 4th Medical Battalion, 4th Marine Division in Camp Pendleton. Uh, I was around uh, during the first Gulf War and um, and uh, am uh, proud to be a, a U.S. Uh, Marine. I, uh, as a matter of fact, um, I graduated from high school on a Friday and uh, was in boot camp on Sunday. <laughs> in, uh, and I don't know how many of you guys are, you know, I'm, I'm assuming you're mainly with the, I'm assuming you're from different branches. Uh, although the everyone served at the air base, right? In one uh, way or, or another. I have an invite for you guys. And I wish I was here in person to invite you. But because of my medical missions work, I go to Vietnam every year. Every year, we take groups of folks to Vietnam, including Vietnam vets, including Vietnam veterans. Uh, you are welcome to hop on a trip uh, if you're interested. And I would love to take you back to the air base. Does that sound like a deal, guys? Let me know if you're interested. Uh, I'd love to take you back to uh, take care of our orphans, hug patients with leprosy and leper colonies, um, watch eye surgeries for the blind, uh, hang out with us during our medical clinics. Um, and, and come back to serve uh, the folks who are the least of these. And, um, and I know many of you guys have stories. I would have loved to be with you now in person to hear your stories uh, with all that. Uh, the other thing you should know is my son, Jonathan, who is now 24, he's an adult now. Uh, Lizzie's in college at, uh, at UC Berkeley and, and Jonathan is currently at um, Quantico, Virginia. Just graduated from officer training school with the Marine Corps, is now in uh, TBS training, the basic school they call it, uh, which is another few months, um, I think six months. And in the midst of that, he'll be graduating this November, and then he starts his uh, MOS training. Uh, I believe he's going to um, infantry uh, training school uh, with uh, the Marines and, uh, and will proudly serve as well. Uh, we are so grateful for you. Uh, I would not be here speaking to you were it not for our veterans. And, and I'm here to tell you how grateful I am. I'm here to tell you that I'm in a community here of over 100,000 Vietnamese who would not be here if it were not for you. And if it were not for, for the sacrifice and the service that, uh, that you've offered. Uh, I'm sitting here as a, a testament to uh, what you have done and, uh, and the fact that because of you, uh, we are given a second chance. And I just want to thank you uh, from uh, the bottom of my heart. And I wish I was with you, obviously, in person to thank you. I uh, want to share a little video with you on... Uh, on Vietnam and, uh, and what we do. So this is one of the silver linings maybe of sharing a video with you uh, and going on Zoom because now I can share my screen and you can see what's going on in my screen. And, and, uh, and uh, I probably wouldn't have been able to do that if I was in person with you just chatting, right? <laughs> what I'm gonna do now is um, let me share my screen with you um let's see here i think i can do this without messing up and there you go great and this is my screen i'm gonna open up um let me share with you what jonathan is doing um in uh quantico uh virginia 
this is back in March. Uh, in March, he graduated from uh, as a, uh, a second lieutenant from officer training school. I, our family flew out. Our family flew out, and I had the opportunity to give the first salute to uh, to Jonathan out in Quantico. This is, I think, we were in front of the uh, the uh, Marine Corps uh, History Museum. Uh, at Quantico there, and and was so proud. The only downside, guys, is now I have to salute him because he just outranked me, Corporal Trin to, you know, Lieutenant Trin. Downside or maybe upside. I'm really proud of him. I'm, I'm really proud of him. Uh, and. Uh, this is Jonathan. This is my wife, Jenny. This is my daughter, Lizzie. Jonathan's girlfriend, Lindsay. Uh, we all flew out to uh, just spend the, the day. There's Jonathan with his bars and Lizzie. And I uh, just wanted to share that. I, <laughs> I got them. Uh, I got them a coin. Let me, I don't know. I'm not sure if I can make this big. I got up a coin that says Semper Fi. Uh, for his uh, for his graduation there, and I uh, wanted to give you guys a little background of uh, of who we are, and uh, as a family, as proud Vietnamese Americans, and um, and proud of our country, and going back to uh, to serve, and so that's that's his platoon with that. Let me also share with you a little bit about um, the work that I do. Uh, this past year, again, um, I wear a bunch of hats, uh, uh, clinical trials with Alzheimer's. Uh, I lead a team that does that. Uh, I lead a team um, this year that did COVID testing uh, for over 400,000 uh, patients in Orange County. Um, but my passion is uh, one of a medical missionary, and I wanted to show you our, our little homepage here uh, of medical missions that we do. Uh, it's uh, tongueout.org is who we are, and we believe we can change the world by uh, giving hope to uh, one child at a time. Um, and so some of our trips includes, uh, and our projects includes eye surgeries, uh, school constructions in Vietnam, medical clinics, orphanage care, and uh, things of that sort. And uh, I want to share with you what we do when we go back to Vietnam. We go back to Vietnam simply because, um, because we're blessed here because we're blessed here and the opportunities we have here. And it's just an opportunity for, for me to give back and to take our doctors and nurses uh, back to Vietnam to, to give back in addition to the other countries. But I wanna share this video with you. And then I wanna share a little bit about my story as well, okay? This is a short little documentary uh, that we have here. Let's see. My name is Jin Din Yong, or in English is Young Trin, or in the real life, everyone calls me Iggy. But my upbringing was in Hue. That's where I was born. A lot of my mem memories was mainly of the war. And what I remember was being a five-year-old boy uh, at the airport in Saigon. And I just remember all the bombing and shelling around us. I saw Chinook helicopters. These are these uh, pickled-looking uh, American military helicopters landing at the airport. And I saw a whole bunch of families, Vietnamese families, uh, running into these helicopters as I realized we were escaping from the war. And it was toward the end. 
And it was uh, eventually our turn um, and a large helicopter would land and we would be running uh, toward it. The back of the helicopter would go down and uh, I saw an American serviceman standing there with his gun. And when I hopped into that helicopter, I knew it was kind of coming into an end. Uh, all this running, hiding. Um, and I felt, even as a five-year-old boy, this load of kind of fear coming off my back. And as the helicopter uh, flew off, um, I looked down, I saw Saigon City, and I saw a whole bunch of green jungle around us, and I felt hopeful for the first time in many years. is uh, Jerry Houston, and I'm the executive director of Seven Day Hero, and we go around the world doing humanitarian work, and we're doing a lot of work in uh, Vietnam. We've been there 20 times, and uh, we do eye surgeries, we uh, work at a leprosy center, an orphanage, school, pagoda, and uh, we try to see the real Vietnam and uh, help people uh, just in some of their basic needs of life. I met uh, Dr. Iggy at a Christian businessman's uh, luncheon, and I got to speak and talk about Seven Day Hero. And he came up to me and said, I'm a doctor, I'm Vietnamese, let's get together. And we did. And uh, we got to know each other through numerous trips to Vietnam. He's been my greatest supporter, and encourager. And uh, we have done many things together, and I admire him greatly. And, Seven Day Hero would not be where it is today without Dr. E. <laughs> My first trip to Vietnam was with Seven Day Hero and Gary Busa in uh, 2013. And that was my first trip back as a uh, doing missions work. Uh, I was so impacted by what I saw there that uh, uh, a year later, uh, two years ago, we uh, took three trips back to Vietnam. And uh, by uh, the end of 2014, uh, Tongue Out was born. I've never been known to be too serious. And Tongue Out originated uh, by the trips we've taken uh, to Vietnam, bring a lot of uh, Americans who couldn't speak Vietnamese. Uh, and it started by the way we communicate with the uh, children and the orphans. And by not speaking that same language, uh, we would have fun with them. And one of that is just sticking our tongues out together. When we hang out with the kids, uh, the orphans, whether it's in Haiti, Mexico, or Vietnam, we basically take off our degrees or education uh, or status in life, and we become like a child, like a kid. And, and to do that, we have to stick our tongues out. I have two goals with Tongue Out. We want to be God's hands and God's feet to try to reach those who need God's love. And we do that by providing lots of hugs, and we're providing medical care, bringing vitamins, bringing hygiene items. Uh, but mainly, we want to be a group that serves the children by just being present there with them because we want to know that they are loved. And uh, it's, a ministry, it's called the Ministry of Presence. And by doing that, we want to give them hope that there are those uh, around the world who love them. We want to show them that, uh, that there's uh, opportunities and hope for them in life. Uh, and then to let them know that there's a God that loves them as well. Hi, my name is Claire Offenberger. I'm a filmmaker, and I'm also on the board of advisors for the Tongue Out Corporation. One of the most impactful things I've experienced through Tongue Out was encountering kids who don't often get to act like kids. And I think that's why Tongue Out is that much more significant, because Tongue Out strives to self-deprecate, to act more like kids. And when you act more like a kid with a child who doesn't get to act that way regularly, it's powerful. So we 
basically, we're going to take their name and their complaints and then send them over to check their vital signs. And then after that, they're going to go see the doctor and get the prescription they need. cancer. He's coming here seeking for help. They are saying it's not respectable. So the best thing we can do is uh, just support them. So we expected to see more people today. Um, we were limited by really what the government allows. So in order to actually be seen, you have to be pre-selected by the government based on your age, whether you can come see us or not. And so they actually have to come in with a hand form from the government to be able to come to a free clinic. So it is uh, how we would think about it in any else. Her name is Ben. Ben is like cake in Vietnamese. Mm -hmm. She's 89. She developed uh, this disease, leprosy, since age 28. She's been here many, many years. Yeah. She said it slowly, her fingers slowly absorbed over time. And so uh, so she's gotten to a point where she can't really eat now because there's got no fingers left. With it. Do you have a yap strap? <laughs> Can you ask one of them outside? Who has a yap strap? <laughs> All right, great. <laughs> we have a yap strap. So this is Yap, and I met him about five years ago. He's the inspiration for the Yap strap uh, that helps uh, people that cannot use their uh, hands or fingers so that they can be independent uh, and be able to eat on their own. And he found something that he stuck around his wrist and stuck a dirty spoon in there and was using it. And uh, I saw that. Um, and uh, saw that maybe we could figure out something that would help. Um, we came up with one. I found an engineer, a Vietnamese engineer in Orange County, and uh, we named it after Yap because he's the inspiration for it. And it's called the Yap Strap. <laughs> yeah. No, she, she can eat better now with this uh, Yap Strap in action. She said it tastes so good. She said there's nothing there, it tastes so good. <laughs> I feel like my whole life I've just been spoiled to death. And I think it's kind of messed up that some people have to go through so much hardship and I'm just born into this life of, I guess, privilege in some areas, like my basic necessities are taken care of and some people have to work daily for those. So I guess I just came to somebody to give back what I never earned. All right. That's uh, Vietnam, guys. That's Vietnam. That's the uh, the work that we do in Vietnam uh, as part of the the nonprofit that I started it um, with my friend uh, Jerry Husson uh, with Seven Day Hero uh, as well, who uh, is a veteran. I um, you caught a little glimpse of my story. I remember it was April 29th, 1975. It was one day 
before Saigon fell, which was April 30th. On April 29th, 1975, I was five years old. And I was at the airport, not inside the airport. I was on the runway, on the tarmac. And uh, you remember the, uh, the pictures of Afghanistan uh, and the uh, last minute evacuation at the airport? Yes, uh, recently. Uh, I remember 1975, April 29th, very clearly. It was a gray day. It was kind of drizzly. A five-year-old kid with my younger brother and sisters. Uh, my sister, uh, Katrina, was three years old. My other sister, Hung, was two years old. And my brother was three months old. Mom was with us. We were at the tarmac on the airport. And all around us, I could hear shooting, firing, mortars going off, yelling, screaming, because it was hours before the end of the war. And so they were fighting street, you know, the, the streeting, street to street fight. And the sounds of war was, uh, was all around me. It was loud, it was chaotic. And we saw these large American Chinook helicopters, you know, the, the pickled looking helicopters, two rotors, the Chinooks. We saw these large helicopters land uh, in front of us. The back would go down and I would watch as people, you know, as folks, Vietnamese just run into the helicopters and the back would go up and uh, the helicopter would take off and another helicopter would land and the back would go down, folks would run in and it'll take off. And then there was a helicopter, a big black Chinook that landed very close to us, probably 100 to 150 feet away. Really windy because we had no protection against the, you know, the wind and the propellers. Really loud. We had no ear protection either. And, uh, you know, I felt I was going to be blown away as a five-year-old kid watching these helicopters land. And, uh, and so... So 150 feet away, the, it lands, the back goes down, and we were told it was our turn to run. So I grabbed my sister, Katrina, I grabbed her hand, and we started running toward the, uh, the helicopter. Mom had uh, one sister in one hand, and uh, my three-month-old brother in the other hand, and, and so we ran toward the helicopter. We got toward the back of the helicopter and, um, and the ramp was down. On the right side was an American serviceman with a, with a pistol. I remember that he has you know, his helmet on, I couldn't see his face. And then I saw the two rows of seats uh, inside the Chinook. Uh, I ran in, sat on the left side and buckled up. And it, although I was only five, it was the first time ever that uh, that I felt a sense of hope for a five-year-old kid, right? I mean, I didn't have that much history or memory, but my memory of the uh, Vietnam was simply memory of the war. Uh, I slept underneath our beds. We didn't sleep on top of our beds because at night we would look outside the window and there's flashes of light going on. And so we knew there was fighting, there were, you know, shooting and, and all that, you know, was going on at night with the flashes of light outside the window. And we were always afraid that the roof would fall down, you know, that something would hit the roof and the house would collapse. So, so I remember as, as a five-year-old kid, four or five-year-old kid sleeping underneath my bed uh, most nights. I remember during the day um, running into bomb shelters when the siren goes off we would all run into, uh, you know, these shelters kind of created and just kind of hide in there. And then I remember at night hearing outside our, uh, outside our walls, hearing the Viet Cong patrolling. We can hear 
their footsteps and we can hear their chatter patrolling at night during the day uh, nobody knew who was who everyone was a farmer working on you know and nobody but at night as you know the Viet Cong took up their arms and started patrolling so we would hear that at night and when we hear them patrolling outside and when we hear their footsteps we would all run to a, a bedroom and just kind of hide uh, together our entire family was in the bedroom uh, just hoping they don't come in hoping that they don't come in I remember even as a four or five year old kid uh, being interrogated by the Viet Cong. My uncle um, was the uh, colonel for the South Vietnamese Navy SEAL. He actually trained out in uh, Coronado uh, Island in San Diego when he uh, was uh, serving during the Vietnam War. He did his training out here in the US, came back. He was a colonel, he was top ranking colonel. And I think they call him frogmen back then. But anytime uncle would come and visit us uh, and visit our family, and, and then he would leave, the Viet Cong would come visit us. Uh, and apparently they're, you know, they're keeping an eye on him. Uh, the Viet Cong would come and visit us and and they would ask us and interrogate us, like, where is he going? Where is he coming from? What's he doing next? What's his plan, right? I remember sitting at, on my bed, and I was living with grandma with, at the time. Uh, I was sitting on my bed, and a Viet Cong guy was just interrogating a four, four or five-year-old kid. And I just remember just being, you know, scared like crapless and uh, just saying, I don't know, I don't know, right? I don't know. <laughs> and I, we would, our family would probably, would probably have been killed by the Viet Cong if it were not for the fact that some of the Viet Cong guys were in our neighborhood and they knew my grandma. And that's probably why we were spared. Um, and those are the memories that I have, guys, of, uh, of Vietnam and, uh, and growing up in Vietnam, which is why I felt so hopeful when I sat down in that Chinook, uh, when I sat down in the helicopter and buckled up, because I knew it was coming to an end. I knew it was coming to an end. And so what happened after that was the, uh, the Chinook helicopter, the back kind of closed up and the helicopter lifted up. And as it got higher, I saw the city of Saigon. I saw the city of Saigon. And as it got even higher, I saw the forest. And everything around me was green back in 1975, right? Outside of the city. And um, it was uh, loud. We had no protection in the ear. But man, it was uh, quite an experience for a five-year-old kid. And the, the helicopter flew over the ocean. The helicopter flew over the ocean. I looked down. It was all blue, right? And had no clue where we were going. You know, we're in, I just know we're over the ocean. And so this helicopter landed on the USS Midway, an aircraft carrier, which is now, you know, decommissioned and docked uh, right in San Diego, uh, about an hour and a half away from where I live. So I was on deck of the USS Midway on April 29th, 1975. I was, uh, I remember standing on deck. Um, they had cleared the, the runway. And, uh, and what I saw was Vietnamese pilots in their Vietnamese helicopters escaping the war, knowing it's coming to an end. So they were flying out their Vietnamese helicopters and what I saw was that the Vietnamese helicopters will land on deck of the midway. Pilot gets off, his family gets off. And I stood there and watched a bunch of people pushing these large helicopters overboard into the ocean because they had no room for Vietnamese helicopters, right? And so all afternoon, I stood there and watched helicopters being pushed overboard. 
the uh, midway and i watch it land into the ocean it was what a quite a wild experience guys being there in person uh, as a kid watching that and i even remember uh a helicopter a vietnamese helicopter that was quite large and wasn't for one reason or another i didn't know the reason but it wasn't allowed to land maybe it was too large or something but it wasn't allowed to land so i saw that helicopter probably about a hundred feet away from the midway and and i remember the helicopter was hovering above the water and then i saw the pilot jumped out of the helicopter as it was hovering and uh, and the pilot was just swimming toward the midway uh, as as the helicopter slowly you know crashed into the ocean and and sunk and that was a quite an interesting uh view to to watch that in front of me um, and, and that was my experience being on the USS Midway. And what happened that day was this. They had put a, us refugees onto these little landing crafts, right? The, the World War II Private Ryan landing crafts. We were all crunched up in these landing crafts like sardines. And so the landing craft left the back of the Midway and I just remember we were bobbing up and down the water uh, the entire time uh, as we left the midway and we were in these small landing crafts. And I had no clue where we're going. I just knew that we we're just whoo, up and down in the middle of the ocean. And so the landing craft met up with a transport ship in the middle of the ocean. And, and I remember as a, as a five-year-old kid jumping from the landing craft and grabbing on to the ropes that were dangling off the transport ship. So, so I jumped, I grabbed onto the rope and I climbed up the ropes of uh, the transport ship. And so uh, that's what we did. That's what, uh, so us refugees, we were taking turns jumping onto the side of the ship, uh, grabbing onto the ropes and just climbing up. I remember they were tossing babies because uh, they were tossing babies from the landing craft to the side uh, of, the, of the ship when others were catching babies. I remember that. Uh, and so we slept on top of the deck of, um, of the transport ship for days. It seems like days. And they gave us a little tent that we slept in. And, um, and the best meal of the day, guys, was lunch. Lunch was the best meal of the day because it was the only hot meal of the day, right? We each family got a Ziploc bag uh, with hot rice and tuna. And that was the best meal of the day. I loved that. I remember that. <laughs> so what happened after that? The, uh, the transport ship dropped us off at the island of Guam. The island of Guam. And Guam apparently was uh, an air base back then. I remember the, uh, you know, the jets taken off. I remember sitting and watching the jets taken off the air base at Guam. And we lived in these half dome, you know, Gomer pile, half dome, uh, quantum huts and slept on the little barracks, right? The little, uh, that was inside the quantum huts. I, I remember having chow, uh, with the, uh, with the Marines and the air force and all that. And, uh, and then Guam, we went and watched outdoor movies, uh, in these large stadium seats. Uh, and so, yeah, I had quite an experience in Guam for a few months. We weren't allowed to enter the United States unless we had a sponsor. We weren't allowed to enter the United States unless we had a sponsor. So we're like, we don't have a sponsor, right? We knew nobody. Uh, so we were just in Guam. And until one day we were told we had a sponsor. And we were like, who would sponsor us? We know nobody in the United States. And guys, we were sponsored by a church and the members of that church. Uh, that church is in Seal Beach, 
in uh, California. And so, so it was actually my first introduction to God. My first introduction to God. I grew up Buddhist. My mom is a Buddhist nun. Uh, my uncle's a Buddhist monk. I went to school in Vietnam as a kid uh, in the Buddhist temples. Right, the Buddhist pagodas were basically our schools. Right, every morning we would chant. We would, you know, do the little gong and do the little chants, and it was all Buddhist stuff. Right, and so this was my first introduction to God. My first introduction to Christianity was actually being being sponsored by the church. And because we were sponsored by the church, we were uh, we hopped on a plane and flew and landed at El Toro Air Base, Marine Corps El Toro Air Base, uh, right here in Orange County, uh, California. And uh, I remember landing, it was my first you know, trip on a plane. Uh, I remember landing uh, at El Toro Air Base, getting off the plane, and, uh, and these large black buses were waiting for us. And, you know, we, we were empty handed guys. Uh, we had no luggage, just uh, the clothes on our back uh, and knew no English. We uh, hopped in the bus. The bus took us down to Camp Pendleton. Uh, and uh, we lived in what was called Tent City. The Marines had uh, created in a, in a single week, they created Tent City, large, large tents. I, um, I met the Colonel actually a few years ago, uh, Colonel Tom McCohen who was in charge of building Tent City, guys. Uh, it was amazing just chatting with him. And, and so the Tent City was the refugee camp for Vietnamese refugees back in 1975 in Camp Pendleton. We stayed in Tent City. I you know, lived in uh, little cots uh, inside large tents. I watched the uh, rattlesnakes running by and all that. Um, and what was a miracle was that dad, my dad escaped on his own and ended up meeting us in Tent City. And so we reunited with dad in uh, Camp Pendleton, um, which is just amazing. Uh, from there, we left Camp Pendleton uh, after some time, went to Long Beach, uh, California, and lived in a, uh, an abandoned uh, YWCA building. It was probably four or five stories high, brick and mortar, kind of shuttered up. And it was just our family and a Filipino family who lived there. I don't even know if we were legal there or not. <laughs> but, uh, but we lived there. Uh, mom stayed home and took care of uh, us four kids. And dad uh, went to go work uh, pumping gas at the gas station. And... And because I was five years old, I started kindergarten as a five-year-old kid um, with no English. And, and that was my start. That was my start. I'm here to tell you that uh, my sister is a, a nurse. She's a professor and teaches nursing. My other sister works for Kaiser. My brother is a, a manager with AAA. I'm here to tell you that I would not be here sharing my story if it were not for you. I would not be here sharing my story if it were not for you and the work and the sacrifice that you've given to give us an opportunity, to give us as an opportunity, us Vietnamese refugees, an opportunity. For a, for a second chance. And I wish I were with you in person to tell you in person, but, uh, but I plan to be one day, right? Maybe next year, or, or maybe when uh, we have better flight plans on the plane. <laughs> but I would not be here uh, if it were not for you. So, so as a representative of the Vietnamese community in Orange County, as a representative, of Vietnamese refugees who are here, who are given a second chance. I'm here to tell you, thank you from the, the depth of our heart. Uh, we appreciate you, uh, we love you, and, uh, and we'd love to be able to meet you in person to thank you. 
And, uh, and I just wanted to come here and, and share that with you guys today during your reunion today uh, and your reunion event uh, in Branson, Missouri. Um, so I'm going to, uh, to sign off and now we're gonna go to our, our question and answer and I'll go on live to chat with you guys, okay? Uh, so God bless. And if you want to come on a missions trip with me, completely welcome to. I want to thank Suzanne for uh, reaching out to me uh, to ask me to, to speak and Jim Frost to, uh, who made the connection and uh, Jim have uh, met me in person. Uh, and uh, you guys are a great team. Uh, we love our veterans. Uh, we love America and, uh, and Semper Fi. So uh, God bless.